Welcome everyone, those of you who are here at Scottsdale Thunderbird Church, those of you who are following us online, we uh, thank you for connecting with us. We're trying to observe social distancing uh, here, so we're leaving both options open, open to you as we reevaluate things uh, moving forward. So welcome to everyone, who, wherever you are, uh, here present or from home. I know some people try to escape up north. I saw some, some pictures. Uh, on Instagram, we also have that, that new page uh, for our church. We're trying to just find different ways uh, to stay connected uh, with you. So uh, let's bow our heads for opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you much for your Sabbath where we get to rest physically, but we also get to rest spiritually and reconnect in a special manner. Uh, with you. We thank you that we have the ability uh, to worship you freely, that we have the ability to praise your name and to also continue to share uh, the message of your love and salvation uh, and grace from everyone here in this world. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, just uh, a couple of uh, announcements. We are still continuing to have our Wednesday uh, prayer meeting group uh, via Zoom. We also have a young adults uh, Sabbath school, school that continues to go uh, through Zoom meetings as well. You can reach out to any of us um, uh, or any of those pages and we'll get you uh, the link so that you can uh, connect uh, to them. Uh, we'll be having board meetings uh, this next month to reevaluate things, evaluate how the CDC guidelines are and We'll have different phases uh, of reopening. You'll hear from us when we start um, getting to the point where we can have Sabbath school uh, together again. I know that's something a lot of us are missing. I know my kids uh, miss being able to, to be with their other friends and their school teachers. And I want you to pray for our schools as they go through uh, their own reopening protocols and, and phases as, as we face uh, this new school year. Um, I want to I want to read you uh, an interesting story that is from 1925, but I think you're going to find uh, uh, some parallels here. This story comes from us from Nome, Alaska. There was a diphtheria epidemic, right? And in this remote part of, uh, of Alaska, that's not near Anchorage or the major cities, they couldn't get the serum, the medication that could prevent uh, this this epidemic from just you know, leveling, leveling those towns. Well, they're like, well, let's, let's, let's take a plane, right? Let's, let's get the medication there. But it was so cold, they said that frequently the temperature there reached minus 31 Celsius, right? I know I went to Andrews. I know I have some people from the New England territory, but I don't know if we have anybody from Alaska here, right? Minus 31 Celsius that the engine could not turn on. The airplane, uh, yeah, it the, the, the gets so cold. I know we had here that it went 125. It was so hot that the cats, you know, we have the opposite uh, phenomenon here. But over there in Alaska, it was so cold that the plane with the medication couldn't get there. And for um, my kids and other kids might recognize the name of Balto. This is a Siberian husky who just by his sense of smell, because the storm was so big, guided, um, Gunner Kassin back and forward to deliver this serum so that the uh, city of Nome could be saved from this epidemic. Well, we are in an epidemic as well, right? And there are, are going to be different interventions coming up, but the world has suffered one major epidemic since the beginning, and that's the epidemic of sin. However, God in his tremendous plan had the perfect antidote, which is love and grace. And through the sacrifice that Jesus made in the cross, he was able to grant us that salvation, that serum of love and grace so that we can be redeemed. The church tries to frequently uh, reach out to those who don't believe so that we can share that love, uh, that medicine for all the ills that sin brings. And one of the ways that we do it is through different ministries and tithing and offering are essential ways that you can do that. Um, we're not going to be uh, using our regular baskets to pick up the offering here, but we do have a section outside where you can uh, um, be able to um, leave uh, your offering as well. And uh, you can also do it uh, like I do. I utilize Adventist given uh, to 
give my uh, offering in there. So uh, let's bow our heads uh, for, to pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that when there's all of these difficulties, your love is abundant, it's infinite, it's so broad that even the most difficult situations, you code us, you give us that warmth. We thank you that we can receive it uh, freely and all we have to do is accept us. Help us continue to be faithful so that this love can be shared, not just uh, with our immediate family and friends, but it can also continue to reach the community here in Scottsdale and its surrounding areas. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. It's good to see all of you here. Uh, it's, uh, even though we're small in group, I know some of us will probably be joining digitally. And so it's my prayer this morning that uh, you'll be richly blessed by uh, fellowshipping with us this morning here together um, as we um, study God's word this morning. Um, I've been studying uh, lately the, uh, and listening to a series on the book of Jonah. Um, and I've been learning a lot, so I'm super excited to share with you some of the things that I've been uh, learning uh, about the book of Jonah. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that it also ties in with the last time that I spoke uh, about the everlasting covenant. We talked about Abraham and how significant that story and how central that story is to the narrative of Scripture. And so this morning, uh, we'll kind of continue on with that kind of, uh, with that theme um, because the story of the gospel and the promise that God gave to Abraham uh, was never to be exclusive. It was to be universal and broad, right? So uh, we'll, we'll share that with you this morning. So uh, I'd ask you to bow your heads with me as we, as we pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your many blessings. And though some of us are here, um, some of us are uh, remote, Lord, we just pray that wherever we are, we know that your spirit is there. Um, we pray, Father, that... Uh, um, we would draw closer to you, that we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us, um, to be in our midst uh, here, but also to be in our hearts, to dwell within us. Um, Father, we pray that the lessons of the book of Jonah would be relevant to us today, 
and uh, as it was from the time when Jesus walked the earth. And um, Father, just pray that not my words or my thoughts, but it would be all uh, Jesus may be lifted up in everything we do today. We ask in his name. Amen. So new things. Um, somehow our society believes that uh, the new is better. You know, the iPhone 10 is better than 7, right? We've just kind of been programmed to think that all these newer versions are always better than the old things. Um, and I don't know, but um, in my experience, um, like right now I have this older iPad. I have a newer iPad, but the, uh, it wasn't working, so I brought my old one. Um, so sometimes not, the new doesn't always work better. My, old, my new one kind of locked me out because I forgot the password, so I can't get back in it. Um, so it was so it was so new in advance that it kind of locked me out. Um, can we tone it down a little bit? Yeah. Um, the other thing that we find in uh, uh, that uh, people think that just new things are better, and and it's a danger for our society because this idea that things that are new that are better, we kind of tend to equate with even just the world that we live in today. Um, that just because things are new, we know better than what they knew a long time ago. And that could be a danger when we're trying to share scripture and to share the word of God, because I believe that the word of God has things to say that are very relevant to today, uh, very relevant for us in our lives and how do we move forward. Um, and I think that that's uh, one of the things that we're going to cover today. And that's one of the amazing things that I've been discovering about this story about the book of Jonah. It's more than just a story about a man who gets swallowed by a fish. It's an extremely complex book and it's uh, the way it's structured and so um, I'll share some of those things uh, with you this morning. So hopefully I will be able to challenge you in uh, looking at the story a little bit differently. Um, for many of you, uh, you probably heard this story as children or maybe as parents you told this story to your children uh, about Jonah, the prophet Jonah. So hopefully this morning we will dive into just a portion of the richness of the message uh, of the book of Jonah. Now, the Ju book of Jonah is, is unique among uh, all the minor prophets. Uh, it's a story that has profundity and depth and complexity, um, the way it's structured. Um, whoever wrote the book of, J of Jonah, and we don't know who it was, but whoever wrote it must have been an extremely intelligent and organized person. Um, uh, it was written anticipating that its readers would also be intelligent to be able to pick up on these nuances. Um, uh, and the other interesting thing about the book of Jonah is that uh, it only mentions two individuals by name, Yahweh and Jonah. Everyone else is just you know, the, there, but only two individuals are mentioned by, by name. And there are only four chapters in the book of Jonah. It's very short. And it's written in a kind of chi chiastic uh, way, uh, meaning that um, in Jewish literature, um, they wrote and they used repetition a lot. And so they would repeat something. But they knew that if they repeated something over and over, it would get monotonous. So what they would do is they would repeat it, and then they would change something to add more meaning to it. And so the book of Jonah is split up into two parts. And both parts kind of mirror each other. And um, it, it's just incredible the way, the, the way that, it's, um, that, that, would, that it's structured. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, See if I can do this. Okay, so this is uh, um, just to give you kind of a setting of what we're going to be talking about today. So you can see there, Joppa is where uh, Jonah kind of took the boat. Uh, you see where Nineveh is, where the call that he said, "Hey, you need to go to Nineveh." Um, you see Ur there, and I put Ur there because Ur uh, is significant because that's you know Nineveh and Ur, all that is Mesopotamia. That whole area is Mesopotamia, and if you remember the story about Abraham. Abraham was called out of, uh, of Mesopotamia. And interesting, Jonah is asked to go to Mesopotamia. And we'll touch on that a little bit. And there you see far off uh, in the Iberian Peninsula is Tarshish. Um, Tarshish is basically pretty far away. I mean, it's, it's like going from here to South America uh, in terms of distance. That's, we're, we're talking a large, large distance. Um, so that's just kind of just to help you um, get kind of a context of where we are. All right, so this is not working. There we go. So here we go. So why study the book of Jonah? I think uh, one of the reasons is uh, to better understand God. The other one is to understand Jesus' mission um, and to better understand our own mission. 
Um, the other thing is to better understand the hostile world that we live in. For Jonah and his time, Nineveh was the hostile world. And then also to better understand ourselves and our mission. Jesus associated uh, himself with the book of Jonah and the story of Jonah very closely. Uh, if you remembered when um, Jesus was here, uh, he was approached by the Pharisees many times. Um, and, you know, they said, hey, um, you know, show us a sign. And interestingly enough, Jesus made the story of Jonah to be very relevant to his time. He quoted Jonah and he, and he, and he basically said uh, in Matthew 12, 38 to 41, he said, then certain of the scribes of the Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there should be no sign uh, to be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be there three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with his generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Matthew 16, 14, the quote that I have up, is another example still in the book of Matthew recorded two and Luke recorded one. It says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and there shall no sign be given into it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. So Jesus, um, you know, connects his, um, his ministry uh, with the, um, the ministry of the book of Jonas. So one of the things that we are going to find is that um, Jesus not only wants to save the Gentiles, but Jesus also wants to save Jonas, the Jonases of the world. He wants to save us all. So the first time the book uh, that Jonas is mentioned in Scripture is not in the book of Jonas, but it's actually in uh, 2 Kings, verse 14 and 25. So in 2 Kings, uh, chapter 14, verse 25, uh, we read this, and this is during the time of Jeroboam II. And we read, read the following. It says, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was in Gethhefer. So that was the first time that, the, that Jonah is mentioned in, in Scripture, and it's mentioned in that. So this happened around 8th uh, eight century B.C. Uh, king Jeroboam was a king. Uh, he served Israel for about 41 years, and he was a bad king, like, his predecessors before him. He, he was a bad king. But one of the things that he did do, according to the word of the prophet Jonah, was they reestablished the boundaries of the kingdom of, uh, of Israel. So the Solomon, the Solomon, what Solomon had conquered and created, kind of that safety net was reestablished uh, here. And it came because Jonah spoke that, and Jonah spoke that uh, through God. There's an irony here, and in the book of Jonah, when you read it, there's, there's, it's meant, there's certain parts of it that you're supposed to laugh. There's, there's an irony, there's a complexity to it that you're supposed to kind of scratch your head um, uh, of it. And one of the things is that here, the irony is that Jonah, who proclaimed the boundaries of Israel, um, was also the prophet that was supposed to go out of Israel and go outside to Mesopotamia to bring the message of God. Um, but we know that... Uh, uh, he, he had a different idea, a different plan, right? Um, but we are reminded that God's message uh, is not exclusive and parochial. Um, the promise of Abraham and uh, the Hebrews was to be a blessing to all the world, not just for them. And the gospel is to be global and universal. And so that has implications for us. And I think that that's why the, the story of Scripture and the narrative of Scripture is so important. And I keep I know every time I preach, I've always come back to this point because to me it's really uh, changed my, my view of how I read Scripture is that this is kind of a, a continuation of a promise. When I read Scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, everything is a continuation of that promise that God made to Abraham. Um, so um, the story of Abraham is actually, I mean, the story of Jonah is quite short. Like I said, it's four chapters, and we're going to read them really quick. Um, you're going to go through it, uh, and so we're going to read the story. Um, and it starts out, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise. That word arise is the same as in the Hebrew is up, like our word up. It says arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, 
from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest of the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. You notice I keep accentuating the word down. God called him to go up, and Jonah keeps going down. And it's, and it's very intentional. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Notice the similarities here. Arise, call on your gods. Perhaps your God will consider us so that, they, so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know to whom the cause of this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Yahweh, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with this innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prayed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, saying, God, from the, fish, from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out unto the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, Out of the belly of Shoal I cried, and he heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and all your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life to the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainteth with me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but, what I, but I will sacrifice unto you. With the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out to dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk that he cried out and said, Yet forty days and night in Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, pro proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. The word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works. They turned from their evil ways and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said? Was, what I still, was I still in my country? 
Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under in the shade till the to the might, so that he might see what would happen, what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, and it made um, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, Is it right for you to be angry even to death? But the Lord said, You have pity on a plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? And much livestock. So that's the story of Jonah. It ends kind of as a cliffhanger. God asks a question and Jonah doesn't answer it. And I think it's intentional that it's not answered. This story is as relevant for us today as it was uh, for, for Jonah. The structure of Jonah, as I mentioned, uh, is separated into two parts. So here's kind of the structure you can follow when, when you read um, from chapter one, with the first three ch uh, verses, God calls Jonah. The mirror of that is chapter, chapter three of Jonah, God calls Jonah again the second time, one, verses one through three. The structure is very similar. Then you have Jonah interacting with the Gentiles. That's the men in the ship. And then you have Jonah and the Gentiles, Jonah in Nineveh, kind of mirrored. And then Jonah calls out to God when he's in the belly of the fish. And Jonah calls out God as well at the end. And so th that's the structure, and it, and it mirrors itself. And um, there is, there's, I was amazed at how the complexity of this story because when you go through it, there's so many parallels. There's also parallels with the story of the Genesis and the flood. It's actually the reversal of what happened in the flood when you go through it. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to take time today to go through that. Maybe that'll be kind of a second or a third part um, to walk you through that. But it's just incredibly fascinating. Um, also, similarities between, remember when Jesus was on the ship, and he goes down to sleep. Same thing, there's parallels with Jonah and that story and uh, the story of Jesus when he calmed the, the sea and the storm. Um, just, just, you know, just incredibly fascinating. Um, and in the flood story, it's that reversal is kind of interesting in that God's servant were above the water, saved, and the Gentiles perished, right? In Jonah, it's the reverse. It's totally flipped. The Gentiles are up on top of the ship, and Jonah is at the bottom of the, the, the sea, right? So it, it just, just, just incredible parallels um, and a, a lot of irony. Um, but this morning, the one that we're going to focus on is the story of Abraham, the parallels with the story of Abraham. So the, Jew, uh, so the many layers, um, Jonah is unique in his call to Nineveh, a foreign country. It was an adversarial city. It was a dangerous place. They were known for their wickedness. They were very violent. Um, and all the other prophets in Scripture, all the prophets, they go to Judah or Israel. They proclaim their messages to Judah or Israel. Jonah goes, is asked to go to Nineveh, goes to Mesopotamia, not to Israel, not to Judah. He, he's asked to go to a foreign city to make this proclamation. So that's kind of another unique portion of the call of Jonah. It is ironic that the prophet, again, that, that had the uh, restoration of the borders of, that Solomon had established is the one that God had asked to go and proclaim outside to, to another nation. If you remember when God called uh, Abraham, Abram at the time, 
What was the intent? Was it to preserve the DNA? Was it to play favoritism? And, and the answer, of course, is no. The call of Abraham was never to be exclusive just to the Hebrews, but as it was meant to be universal and all-encompassing. And to what end? The end was, let's go back and look at Abraham as a way of reminder. The first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, Moses races through. He races through history, going through them. Um, and, and, and basically, he's covering 2,000 years of history in 11 chapters just to get to the story of Abraham. And then from chapter 12 to chapter 50, the rest of the book of Genesis, he puts on the brakes, he slows down, he starts talking about the story about Abraham and his family and his descendants. So the five events that happened in Genesis very quickly was there was a creation, there was a fall, there was a murder, there was a flood, uh, and then there was a tower. Those are the, those are the, the, the five elements in the first uh, books of uh, Genesis. So let's look at the, the story uh, of Abraham. Uh, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Um, and, and it's interesting that for Moses and all of the Bible writers, the Abrahamic story is kind of the central structure of Scripture. It's what's taking place in the book of Jonah is symbolically is kind of the same as what the call of Abraham was. So let's, let's, let's read it here, um, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. It says, now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. You know, at this point, as you read that, you, you, you think, well, it kind of seems very exclusive to Abraham. But then you get to the punchline and it says, and in you, all the families other versions say nations, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So the call is not about Abraham, but what Abraham was called to do. Not parochial, not regional, but he was called to bless all the nations of the earth. And that also included Nineveh. Nineveh was a nation of the earth. It included Nineveh. If you recall in the Tower of Babel, what's fascinating is that God disperses the nations. Basically, linguistically, culturally, people are separated. We create an us and them. And there's a lot of thems. And there's Israel, there's Hebrews, there's only one. There's one. But there's a lot of thems out there. There's, there's us and them. But that's not, that's what was created in, uh, in, in, in Babel. And so the answer to it was, that was in, in uh, chapter 11 of Genesis. The next very same thing is the call of Abraham. And in the call of Abraham is God's plan to restore and bring everything back together, to restore, to bring the families of earth. Because God did not like to have a them and an us. He did not have, he did not plan for the earth to be so separated to for us to treat each other as them and us. It was for all of us to be one. That was God's plan and God's intention. And that's God's vision and plan through Jesus and through the promise that was going to go through Abraham. So, um, so Jonah and Israel tried to thwart this plan. Uh, you know, they, they, they did their best. Um, but notice some of the similarities, similarities um, here. So here's the call of Abraham. Out of Ur, so come out of Mesopotamia, away from a known and secure place, beyond the borders, go to other nations, go to a dangerous location and dangerous situation, and to be a blessing to the world. That's pretty much kind of the, the, the breakdown of the call of Abraham. And you will notice, I'm gonna put up the call uh, of Jonah. And very little changes. The difference is he's asked to go to Assyria, to Mesopotamia, uh, but he was also called away from a known and secure place, the borders of Israel, beyond the borders to other nations, go to Nineveh, to a dangerous location and situation, well, Nineveh was an adversary. They were, they were, this, they were a superpower. And they were, um, you know, very violent people. But the goal was the same thing, to be a blessing to his wider world. In um, Galatians, so when Paul, um, in, in Galatians 3, 28 through 29, um, Paul says, 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, an heir according to the promise. What promise was he referring to? It's the promise that God made to Abraham, right? The, com the promise that he would be a blessing to all. There's no us and them. In Christ, Paul says, there is no longer black and white. Um, there's no, no us and them, uh, male or female. They're, we're all one in Jesus. And there's just an us. So, you know, when you start thinking and we start thinking about things about us, our world perspective, our view, and our relationships with one another would change dramatically by having this kind of Abrahamic view of God's promise where we're not just Seventh-day Adventists and it's only us, but we, we take a broader view. We start looking at others as them being part of us as well. There is a few you know, extreme lessons that jump out very quickly in, in the story of Jonah. Um, if Jonah would have understood the call when he said, arise or up, go to Nineveh, his call would not have only established the borders of Israel, but would have gone outside and start sharing God's word with others immediately. But Jonah lost sight of that Abrahamic call, and he thought that they were called to be exclusive, parochial, and only about the Jews. And we should, you know, we should, he thought we should be afraid of those people. But God calls us to take the message to Nineveh. So Jonah arose, and what did he do? He fled. So one of the few, the, the biggest lessons is danger with God is safer than safety without him. That, you know, that to me is just being, it doesn't matter what you're in, what situation you're in in life. To, to be in any condition in life, but to be with God is far much safer than any other place that you could place yourself to be. Another way of saying uh, the same thing is Nineveh with God is better than Tarshish without him. You know, um, Tarshish was, um, even today, if any of you have been to uh, the south of Spain, you know, in Portugal, uh, southern coast, it's almost semi-tropical climate. I mean, it's incredibly beautiful, kind of idyllic. It's just really, really nice. And so who wouldn't want to go vacation to uh, Tashish? You know, can you blame Jonah? And he's, you know, when he's faced with this call, do I want to go to Nineveh where they're violent and they're uh, Gentiles? And, uh, or do I want to go to Tashish where maybe I can vacation, lay out in the sun? And, you know, where would you rather go? Proverbs 14, 12 uh, says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Uh, for us, um, it seemed just like Jonah, it seemed right to go to Tarshish to uh, find and seek safety in his own way, um, to try to find happiness uh, in our own efforts. But true happiness cannot be found outside of God. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. It says, God can't give us peace and happiness apart from himself because there's no such thing. There's no such thing as happiness, as peace without God. Let that sink in for a moment. And so that's why for, for Jonah, for him to, to, be, to leave, to go in the opposite direction, um, Jonah thought he was making a horizontal separation from God. God told me to get up and go that way, but I'm just going to separate. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going I'm to do my own thing. What seemed right in his eyes. God can't be right. Why is he sending me? All the other prophets, they went to Israel. Why should I go to Israel? Why can't I go to Israel and Judah? Why do I have to go to uh, Nineveh? I wonder if God is calling us to take some risk in life. Not risky things, but godly risks. You know what I mean? There's, there's certain risks that God is asking us to take. Nineveh was outside of Jonah's comfort zone. God called uh, to Israel was not about keeping borders and keeping people out. God's call to our church isn't about keeping people out. 
but getting them in, right? Those are, that, that's kind of our call. So here's the, the quote uh, that we read earlier in, in Galatians. That when we have Christ, in Christ, all socioeconomic things go away, color, race, all these things go away. We're all one in Christ. This horizontal separation and vertical separation that we see is the same that happened in the story of creation, the same thing that happened with, with Adam, right? Um, they lost that vertical separation from God pretty soon after that. There was horizontal alienation between themselves uh, that took place. And one of the mistakes that Jonah and Adam and Eve make is that their view of God, they, they don't run to God, they run away from God. Right? They run away. They hide. They go, and that's the same thing that Jonah does. He goes and he hides from God. God is someone that we should run to, not somebody that we should run away from. That it doesn't matter if you know you feel guilty. You know if you've you know whatever things have happened in your life. Um, God is a kind of father that we want to be able to go to, that we can say, Father, I've made a mistake. If Adam and Eve would have run to him, Father, we've made a mistake. We have erred. Instead of running and hiding and covering yourself on your, on your own, if they would have run to him. But, but, but yet there's a tendency for us to think that we know what's best. The new is, is better. You hide in God, not from him. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to hide in God. Even in our condition, even through all our mistakes, we hide in God, not away from him. Whether, you know, we're battling, we're exhausted, you know, when we're beaten down, when we're just super tired, when we're just ornery, when we're just at our worst. At those times, it's not time to flee from God. It's time to go to God. It's time to be with God, to be in him. For a lot of, for a lot of us, sometimes the, the idea when we have erred and we have made mistakes, we get this idea in our head that somehow the guilt that we feel inside somehow is a projection of what God thinks of us, but that's not true. God's thoughts through us are abundant like the sands of the sea, our good thoughts toward us. So we should run to him. When we fall, we should run to him. It doesn't matter if we're plagued with cancer. Whatever we might find, it is better to deal with that with God than without him. So this morning, you know, I don't know what you're going through. You know, for me, this uh, not, you know, working remotely, it's, it's kind of been a, a mixed thing because for, you know, almost 30 years, I'm used to going into an office and working and, and being with people and interacting. Um, and for the past five months or so, you know, we're at home. And it's very different. And it's a blessing in that, you know, yeah, I'm with my family, kind of. I mean, we're in the same house. I'm still working. But, but it's different. You, you, it doesn't feel the same. Even, you know, being here at church is like, you know, I'm glad we're all here and, and I'm glad to see all you. But it feels a little different, right? We're wearing masks, you know. We're, you know it's, it just doesn't feel the same. But no matter what we go through, I think, you know, it, going through all this experience that we've been going through, I'm just glad that we can go through it together. We can go through it knowing that God is with us and that we're not alone in this. He, he wants us to kind of go to him with our anxieties, with the things that kind of wear us down, um, especially more so now, you know, when we're isolated and we're not connected and, you know, we're not, you know, maybe studying God's word as regularly as we, you know, because we're not in a group, we're not interacting. It just feels different. But God's posture for us is the same as the posture that he had for, the, for Nineveh. God is a God of mercy, a God of love, a God of compassion. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what does that mean for us, for the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church? How does, how does that knowledge, how does, how does knowing that, how does that affect us? And how do we change the way we interact with those when we could start maybe going back to work or you know, even now it's, um, you know, I go, I might have like one, once a week I'll go into the office or I'll have a meeting outside the house. 
when we interact with others, there's an opportunity for us to share um, in that God that we know. That's a God of mercy, a God of love. God's posture toward us is not one of, of condemnation, but one of compassion. His thoughts are about constantly giving us good, and prospering us and giving us a future. In Christ, God's thought towards us are you know, more expansive than the sands of the sea. So Jonah thought that his decision to flee away was a small decision. It was a horizontal separation. But it was really a vertical separation from God. He was alienating himself. Instead of running to him, he ran away. And that's never a good place to be. So whatever you're going through in life today, I just encourage you to be reminded that God's posture toward us is one similar to the book of Jonah, which is he is a merciful God, a forgiving God, full of love and compassion. And that was for Nineveh as it is for the world around us, for us. He doesn't want any of us to perish, not just Adventists, all Christians, right? It's for all those who don't know him that he, to be able to give them a hope, to give them a future as well. And that's good news. That's the gospel. It's good news that we can share Jesus. And so I encourage you to find ways to not run away, but to go to him. I guess the benediction falls on me, so <laughs> since we're kind of shortened uh, uh, services as well. Um, let's bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we uh, thank you for your word. Uh, for the beauty, for the complexity, for the richness um, that, that is in it, uh, even in the story of like Jonah. Father, I pray that uh, you would help us to not be like Jonah in that uh, we would run away from your call uh, to serve or your call to do anything, but that we would um, instead, Lord, um, more like the second time around, arise and obey and go. Uh, and so, Lord, uh, whatever we are going through today, um, just pray that uh, you would help us to... Um, know that we can get through anything uh, and anything is better going through it with you than going through it alone. So Father, we just give you thanks and pray that you would bless everyone here. Um, may you keep us uh, safe. May your Holy Spirit um, transform and change us and make us more like Jesus each and every day. We pray in his name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone.